Okay, thank you, Carrie. Uh, I'm Aaron Buell. I'm the current treasurer of the chapter, and I'm filling in for Randy, who is out enjoying a well-deserved vacation this week. Um, so first, we, when we have our meetings, we start out with our business update. I'll keep it short and sweet so we can get to the, the meat of the presentation. These uh, beautiful pictures are from Randy's yard. The plant of the month is Texas Green Eyes. It has a striking yellow flower with a green center. It blooms from April to November, so a very long bloomer. Um, it likes part shade, provides nectar for pollinators, as you can see in the, in the smaller photos. And it has medium deer resistance. A financial update, our chapter funding is very healthy. We have 145 memberships, um, which would be more than 145 people as uh, some couples have a single membership for both. Um, spending is down this year because we haven't had as many activities as a usual year due to COVID. And um, the income has been very good from our plant sales at alternate sites to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. Um, before this last year, that's where we always did our plant sales. And now this year we're using farmers markets and Berry Springs Pavilion. So we had our, our spring sale at Berry Springs Pavilion. It was scheduled for Friday and Saturday. It lasted for about, I don't know, I wasn't there two or three hours and we were all sold out of all of our inventory. So very successful, much easier than all of us trekking ourselves and all the plants down to the South Austin Wildflower Center. So in the fall, mark your calendars, 925. We will be back at Berry Springs Park. COVID restrictions permitting, I suppose. Um, our upcoming programs, um, on August 14th, our next monthly meeting, we'll have Foraging for Edible Plants in Central Texas with Eric Knight from Local Leaf LLC. Um, then I'll, I'll let you uh, look at the, the October, November. And we do have a spot open still in September. So if anybody has any ideas um, of program speakers, please contact Susie Hickman from our chapter. She is the program coordinator. Erin, I do have, uh, I, I saw some emails about that. Uh, that might be a speaker from the, the Nest Center, which is part of the Georgetown uh, Community Project, or the okay. Georgetown Project. So we have a September speaker in the works. Right. I'm sure by September 9th, we will have somebody. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Our chapter meetings in the in the past year, year and a half have been on Zoom. Um, Zoom has been great. It lets a lot more people attend. Um, we've even have a lot of folks attending from outside of Williamson County. We've been recording the meetings. They are up on our YouTube channel. So you can watch, if you miss a meeting, you, it's available to watch later. Um, but we do miss the camaraderie and the, the time to socialize with each other. And so we're working on setting up our future meetings that they would be a hybrid. We'll meet, uh, normally we'll rent a room in the, in the Georgetown Library when it's available. And some folks would be in the room for a live meeting, but we were, were planning to also continue to broadcast on Zoom and post on YouTube. So um, stay tuned, more to come on that. Um, and it also depends on the, the library COVID restrictions right now that we could rent a room, but with only 25 people. So but it's looking good that we'll be able to start doing this soon. Ongoing chapter activities. We have um, lots of volunteers, particularly Charles Newsom in the photo, working on invasives removal. We have a landfill pollinator garden out. I think that's at the Hutto landfill. We do that one together with the uh, Master Naturalists, the Nest Pollinator Garden, the Spirit Rains Pollinator Garden. We have a native plant garden at the Georgetown Public Library. And we also have interpretive plant signs out at several parks in Williamson County. And uh, when Vicki presents from the field trip committee, uh, you'll see more updates about where the signs are and future plans for signs. We had our first in-person field trip a couple of weekends ago. It was native plant landscaping in an HOA at Sun City, Georgetown. Um, this photo was taken at the um, Horticultural Center and the photos from Randy's garden that we started the presentation with were from, 
from that field trip also, Randy shared uh, the plantings in her yard. So a real fun uh, field trip, a nice entry back into in-person events. Um, this Saturday, we have another field trip at Hidden Springs Preserve. This preserve is a, a new property owned by Williamson County, not open to the general public. We're doing a plant survey there, which will take place over the next couple of years. We'll go um, at all every month of the year and, and uh, hike around and identify different plants that we can find there. But everyone is welcome. You don't need to know the plants. We'll have people there that do know that. And it's a good opportunity to get out, see and uh, preserve a kind of a hidden gem of a property and learn about some of the plants in our area. And to find out more about that field trip, you can follow that link at the bottom. Um, and it's in the on our on our blog on the what we do field trip section. Uh, mark your calendars for October 6th through 10th. That is the state fall symposium. They are planning a hybrid virtual event with in-person events done locally by each chapter. Um, that's about the level of details that I have heard about so far, so more to come on that one. It's uh, It may be an interesting format and certainly easier than um, hosting the, the larger hotel convention centers with so many people gathering in one spot, but probably not quite as fun either. So we'll see how this goes. The board election results. Uh, we just closed the Google form for the board elections. And this is our new board for next year, starting September 1st through August 31st of next year. Our incoming president is Beth Irwin, who will be presenting next. Our vice president, Nancy Copperman, secretary. I will continue as the treasurer. Tre these uh, elected board positions are on a two-year term, and I started midterm, so this will be my second year as treasurer. And um, we're thinking about trying to continue that so that we don't have every two years a new president and a new treasurer. So we have the president and the treasurer sort of offset from each other to make the onboarding easier. Then we've got our two director at large positions. We have Vicki Blockman and Charles Newsom, and Randy Pensabine will be our past president. So thank you to everyone. Congratulations. Um, we look forward to working with everyone for the, the year ahead. And these are the appointed board members. Um, we have Diana Wilson for community engagement. Gary Bowers and Sue Weissman on our education committee. Kathy Galloway is the head of our field trip committee. Nancy Copperman for membership. Randy Pensabine will take over the plant sale again from Beth. Susie Hickman runs our programs. Nancy Pumphrey will lead the projects. And Pat, oh gosh, Pat, your name is covered by the box. Sorry, Pat Donica is our wonderful webmaster who takes care of the blog and the emails and all of the technical stuff on the communication side. If you wanna find out more about the chapter, here are some links to our social media sites and our blog, our YouTube channel. And we have every uh, month a book giveaway. The book that we'll be giving away this month is Native Texas plants landscaping region by region and last month's winner was Sharon of Georgetown for the same book so at the end of the meeting we can pull from zoom a report of who attended and we do a random number generator to pick the winner and we you will be emailed Okay, tonight's speakers. We have Beth Irwin presenting Wicked Plants of Central Texas. Beth is a horticulturalist. As you saw, she is our next chapter president starting on September 1st. She's promoted the use and preservation of native plants and habitats to the, to the public for the past 40 years. She managed a private nature preserve in Louisiana from 93 to 2017. We're very happy to have her in Williamson County with her extensive knowledge of horticulture and native plants. And she was a charter member of the Louisiana Native Plant Society. 
Now following Beth, we'll have uh, from a, a, the field trips committee, Vicki Husband. She has been a NIPSOP member for 15 years. She's been on the field trip committee for 10 years. She's interested in the identification and propagation of native plants. She attended taxonomy classes with Flo Oxley, and she's excited to participate in the next plant survey at Hidden Springs Preserve. So I will unshare my slides so Beth can share hers, and we will hear about the, what was it, the wicked plants. Sounds scary, Beth. All right. I'm going to start this because I hate a long meeting. <laughs> I can find my, uh, there it is. All right. All right. Wicked plants. Now, this is not a long talk, and there are not a lot of plants in here, but I uh, kind of put this together for my garden club, and I see that there's a lot of garden club members from Georgetown watching tonight, and it's a rerun for you, but it's not a complete rerun because I rearranged some things. I'm uh, starting off with, and I, when I chose wicked plants, now they've got a wicked element to them, and they're also very common. You could definitely come across any of these on a field trip or invite them into your house unwanted possibly in some cases. Um, all of them have some sort of toxicity, but, but one, and I just added it today. But I'm starting, I'm starting with poison oak, because it's the one that people, gives people the most trouble. And I decided working on this, that if, if poison ivy had a spirit animal, it's a skunk. Because if you've ever had skunk problems, they're similar to poison ivy problems. It just jumps in your brain and saps out all your emotional energy and so forth. Now, personally, I'm not really, uh, I'm not one that breaks out severely to poison ivy. Um, I break out in it when I get a cut or something, but managing that nature preserve for 25 years and leading thousands of school children from preschool to high school through it, it was my goal that they never, they please do not take poison ivy home to their household. So I was pretty experienced in that direction. The chemical we're talking about is your ruchiol. And um, one of the reasons that you have so much of it or that you, you know, it's around and it shows up, it is the number three favorite fall fruit for resident birds and for migrating birds in our migratory zone. So there's a picture of the flowers and the fruits and then the ripe fruits. Ripe fruits have lots of fats and oil in them. And um, if you're flying to Central America or South America on your own two wings, that's what you're looking for. And you do have some local. So here's your local poison ivy landscape installation crew. You got mockingbirds, uh, woodpeckers and bluebirds. And then flycatchers or another, they're frugivores. They love poison ivy. Here's three vines that I get texts from my adult children's college friends. Someone in their family, a child or a husband or so much, someone breaks out with poison ivy and they know he's been working or she's been working in the yard or they've been playing in the yard. And so they text me pictures all the time. Is this poison ivy? It's usually trumpet vine or pepper vine. The thing that looks most like it, just at a casual glance, would be Virginia creeper. Virginia creeper has five leaves. Most people know poison ivy has three leaves. But on a general Virginia creeper vine, on that new growth up there, there will be some three leaves. But if you back down the vine and find four or five leaves on it, you know you're looking at Virginia creeper. Trumpet vine. Other than being dark green and glossy, it does not have three leaves. It's got much more, more compound leafless and pepper vine also. But the thing is, is they all hang out together because they all fall out of those birds, those seeds do. Now here in our area, along our creek banks and, and river banks and so forth, along the San Gabriel River and Brushy Creek and all of our waterways, we have three other things that are just wildly confusing for figuring out if you've got poison ivy. You've got wafer ash, which accommodates you with these here three leaves are nice and dark green, but fortunately right now they've got wafer ash fruit hanging on them. But if you encounter it along the San Gabriel River, it may have poison ivy all wallered up in it. So, you know, if you know you're sensitive, just stay away. Here's another one, cowwitch vine. Some of you are thinking, oh my gosh, that looks exactly like poison ivy. And it kind of does in the picture, 
but if you see it in person, it's a little bit succulent and thick. It's related to that house plant that was real popular back in the 70s and hanging baskets called grape ivy. In fact, it's the same genus, but there's another three leaves and it could also be hanging out with poison ivy. And then over here, you've got box elder, which is also called ash leaf maple, three leaves. And in this picture, you actually have some poison ivy. I can zoom up here, down here, that dark green. I hope y'all can see my hand moving around. That's poison ivy and the box elder is lighter green. But one of the things that uh, even Texas A&M says is that box elder seedlings are almost impossible to distinguish from young poison ivy. So isn't that fun? And I've lost my mouse completely. I hit the button where you advance. Yes, all right, poison ivy habitat. Anywhere beneath where a bird can or used to perch, including fences, eaves of the buildings and trees. It's especially common in areas favored by migrating birds, dreamside habitat. Um, one thing about poison ivy, when it gets wallered up in all those, uh, with all those other trees and vines and so forth on a building, old building or along the creek bank or something like that, if we have a dry spell, which we haven't had lately, it'll start dropping its leaves. So it will still be in there with its oily sticks waiting on you when you get in there and start pulling vines and thinking you're gonna clean it out. And of course, I think most of you know not to incinerate it because the smoke is just as toxic as the plant. And every couple of years you hear about some poor fellow that you know, burned a brush pile full of poison ivy and inhaled it. And now he's as miserable inside as he is outside. Here's what I consider the champion poison ivy vine of Georgetown. And this one is at the corner of Northwest Boulevard and Whisper Oaks Lane. And that's an old ash juniper probably with poison ivy vine up in it. And you can see the woody vine with the fruit coming out from the side there. And I walked up right up to the trunk and you know, juniper has kind of a twisted trunk. Well, the Big old poison ivy vines are just twisted into the trunk. So you couldn't get rid of that if you wanted to, if it was in your yard. But that's a nice, nice example of what poison ivy will do under irrigation. Next thing is mistletoe. And the toxin with mistletoe is phorotoxin and viscotoxin. Neither one of those are, I mean, if you as an adult, weight human were to eat a mistletoe berry, it might not even make you very sick or sick at all. But if it tumbles off the floor and your little puppy dog or your little two-year-old eats it, that's a different matter. It could make them ill, might even be fatal to a really small dog. And I put this in there because we see this when we're out on field trips up in trees, you see it along uh, the side of the road. Here's an example of what it looks like. It's better if you're going to uh, Christmas decorate with it, if you must bring mistletoe in your house to encourage, uh, well, I made this, I didn't think about this with COVID, but I don't know if you want people kissing one another or not, but if you do, you're all vaccinated or whatever, I would recommend that you find some artificial mistletoe with berries, and then you can stuff some of the regular stuff in there without, the live stuff in there without the berries for, to get more of the effect. All right, here's one I added. In fact, I added it today. This one is not toxic, but man, I have been pulling so many of these out of my shoelaces and out of my dog's paws that my fingertips just feel like pin cushions. Got so many holes in them. This is a true grass sandbar. It's typically found in poor soils where hardly anything else will grow. And it's doing its job there. It's catching and sifting fine gravel and silt and starting the process of soil retention for future species. It's a pioneer. Does it compete well with other species? But will this rain, bare spots are turning green in a hurry. So you've got to watch out. I'm seeing it in spots I don't normally see it. The picture over here on the left will show, uh, shows it kind of in the crack between asphalt and concrete in the street. And that's typically it'll be on a limestone outcropping. It'll be in sandy cemeteries. It's native 
all the way to the Atlantic coast. And like I say, I, I'm familiar with seeing a good bit in cemeteries. Of course, cemeteries are, old cemeteries are generally high and dry and poor soil. So that's a good place for sandbar. It's real happy there. But here's a really healthy, well-watered uh, example of sandbar growing right now. Next one is the poinsettia family or the spurge. And this particular one I'm picking on is snow on the mountain. There's also another very similar one called snow on the prairie. Now the white latex that oozes out of members of this family when, it, or when it's injured make up more than 30 compounds. And they're capable of causing skin irritation and even temporary and permanent blindness if it's splashed in the eyes. Euphorbia plant family is the fifth largest flowering plant family in the world with about 7,500 species. Now, the reason I'm picking on snow on the mountain is a lot of the spurges you run across are like these weedy ones, the two pictures on the left and the picture in the upper right. These are, if you break them or break a leaf off, a little tiny drop of white latex will appear. But if you break that, or here's another example in the middle is a, is a house plant, common house plant. Um, Surely I have its name here. Pencil cactus and then crown of thorns down here on the right. Either one of those, you break them, they just ooze a little white goo and you're probably not gonna splash that in your eye. But snow on the mountain, when it's been watered like it is now, um, it will just about blow latex out of the stems if you cut it or break it. And you can really splash yourself with a good bit of latex if you go out and think, hey, I'm gonna fix myself a bouquet of, late, of uh, snow on the mountain. And the key to doing a bouquet of snow on the mountain is cut it with gloves and keep your arms covered because I've had violent reactions to it, juice all over my arms. Um, put it in a jar of water, let the water turn milky about like non-fat milk, dump that water, put it back in clean water. When that turns milky, dump that. And about the third time, you're not gonna have milkiness. But don't let any of that diluted latex from that water splash on you you or in your eyes or anything like that. So be careful with it. But that's the a good example of the euphorbia family. And, and then we've got some more that are even better armed than just the latex, like Texas bull nettle. You see those little spines on there? I really hate this one. Those little spines contain a little drop of formic acid, which is one of the um, byproducts of an ant sting. So it will bleed white sap if you work past all those spines and actually break it or cut it, but you're not probably not going to get there. Um, this is the plant that stings like an ant. As soon as that um, spine hits you, it's formulated to inject that little bit of formic acid into your skin. And boy, I'm telling you, it will go through, uh, I've had it go through the back of my blue jean legs on my calf and then I've got fire ants up my pants, but it's, uh, it's very innocuous. Uh, it's got a pretty white flower, but it's a kind of a medium green and it can be, if it's not an area that's grazed, which of course all the grazers know to leave it alone. So if, if it's a heavily grazed area, it'll be nice and tall and easy to see. But if it's not in a heavily grazed area, it'll be about the height of everything else. And it's kind of a medium green and I spare, swear all those fuzzy little spines help it blend into the surrounding environment. So here's uh, one of its kind of lookalikes, this white prickly poppy, which also will bleed a, a milky latex is not quite as toxic as this and the spines don't hurt near as bad. Actually, they don't hurt at all compared to Texas bull metal. Here's another one uh, in the same euphorbia family, nose burn. We have about six species native in Texas and some of them are kind of viney and some of them are kind of bushy and they are very subtle, innocuous little things. That leaf is probably not a half inch wide, maybe an inch long. Just a little green plant down there mixed with everything else. But it too has got, it's got a little um, crystal on the end of its spine that's gonna, and then you're gonna get a little oxalic acid and it's gonna burn. And 
you'll get it when you put your hand, maybe you squat down on the ground to look at that pretty little flower or something else. And it's, this is nearby and it gets you. And a couple of seconds later, your hand burns or your ankle burns or something like that. And of course, your paranoia is high now because you're already out in the bush and that kind of thing. And you're, you're thinking snakes. And so you think, first thing you think is that you'd snake bit, but that's not the case. Or then you've gotten into fire ants, but it's not, it's nose burn. I think it gets its name from cows getting their noses burned by it or, or people touching it and then rubbing their noses. A nasty little wicked plant. All right, last one on the list is Datura. And this is not one that you're likely to rub up against. This might be one that you're growing in your yard. It's also called Jimson Weed Angel Trumpet. Uh, you get atropine in the leaves in the roots and the seeds, hypocene in the roots, and then scopolamine in the rest, some of the rest of the plants. This is, um, you know, this is an extremely toxic plant. You don't want your animals chewing on it or your toddlers or, any, or your adults either for that matter. You don't want to incinerate it. Don't smoke it. Don't put it on the burn pile and then breathe it. There's a couple of uh, there's a couple of uh, Datura hybrids that are grown popular horticultural things that you'll see growing in people's yards and sold at the nursery. Same bucket though, just as poison, just as toxic. These two are not as cold hardy as our native one, okay. and that is what I have for wicked plants of Central Texas. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Yes. I uh I don't see any questions that we didn't answer in the uh hold on, I'm trying to get my y'all didn't on. get. Yeah, we have, and lots of comments and some uh couple of folks that sound like they're familiar with some of these that had some good advice for dealing with them too. So Oh, you know, I had a thought about that before we started because I had said, I told him, I said, I don't want this to deteriorate on what do I do about poison ivy, but we could really use the action on the chapter Facebook page or on Instagram. So boy, if you'd chime in on that, you know, we'd love to hear you, you know, we'd love an argument or two to get going, Any, anything <laughs> like that, 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 you know, so, okay. Okay. Thank you. And now, um, Beth will be followed by Vicki Husband. She she's going to present uh, what the field trip committee's been up to over the last year. Hi everyone, good to see you. Let me share my screen. All right, how does that look, Miss Erin? If you can let me know, because I great. cannot see. Really? Okay. Yep. All right, and then if you don't mind, I'm just going to try. Oh, let's see. I just want to make sure I can change my. All right. All right, everyone. Well, it's July. It's been about 18 months. Uh, my name is Vicki Husband, and I'm a longtime member of the field trip committee. Uh, tonight, I'll be sharing with you what we've been doing for the last 18 months and uh, what we have planned for the rest of 2021. So first off, we miss you. And it's hard to believe that uh, before last weekend, our last in-person field trip was March 14th of 2020. I'm still surprised by that. At the time, we had no idea, even though we were doing a, lot of so a little bit of social distancing and mask wearing, I think. Uh, we had no idea it would be like a year, more than a year before we got together again. And um, in-person field trips being my favorite part of being a member of the Native Plant Society, I had a little withdrawal there. All right. So the field trip committee, uh, during the pandemic shutdown, we put uh, everything on hold, um, followed the state guidelines, uh, that chapters must follow uh, CDC guidelines. And so we went to Zoom pretty quickly. Right away, uh, Gary Bowers started filming 
a virtual plant walk. I think it was literally that next month. And he posted that on March 24th, 2020. He went to, um, well, Gary Bowers is our past president and uh, also like our technical guru. So he was the perfect person to take on this project for us and step out on a limb there. Uh, I thought it was really cool. He went to Berry Springs Park and Preserve, started at the kiosk and went west, uh, which is kind of a, more of a mulch trail, kind of a natural area, but it's got pockets of, um, you know, big pockets of plants where you have like a monoculture and, and whatnot. So when Gary made this video, um, that in my opinion, that kicked off our YouTube channel. And uh, he included some resources and whatnot. Thank you, Gary, that was awesome. Uh, the next thing that came together during the pandemic was a River Ranch uh, County Park virtual hike in 2020. So Gary Bowers got with Sue Wiseman, um, whose uh, pet project is River Ranch County Park. Um, she is also a past president of NIPSOT and a long-term, long-time member I think a lifetime member of NIPSOT. And uh, so she hosted the video where she walked around River Ranch and she identified some of the prominent species in the park, along with introducing us to the construction and some of the buildings that are being built out there. Oops. Uh, thirdly, Kathy McCormick um, gave us a blog post uh, during the pandemic of how to do a safe and self-guided field trip using the um, interpretive plant signs uh, that the field trip committee uh, got together and uh, our chapter paid for those. Um, and so she did a nice blog post on how you could take a self-guided field trip uh, without, uh, you know, kind of on your own. Uh, we have these plant signs in four areas of the park and I'll go into that in a minute. But um, I actually thought that was a really nice idea uh, because as I was out in the community during the pandemic, people would ask me, when are we having another field trip? So I felt the same way. So what have we been up to as a field trip committee? Uh, our three favorite things, plant signs, plant lists, and plant surveys. And uh, it was suggested to me that I should explain uh, just real briefly what those three things are uh, to anyone who's uh, not a member of our chapter but might be uh, joining us here on the Zoom. So the interpretive plant signs, let's see if I'll get my notes here. Uh, they are physically, they are physically mounted signs on post designed by the field trip committee and paid for by our Williamson County chapter. Some of the posts were already existing and some we installed. Each sign has a photo of the plant, both a close up and an overview if possible. And most importantly, it has a QR code that can be scanned with your smartphone. So this QR link on the interpretive plant sign, here's an example. Uh, the QR link on the interpretive plant sign gives you an immediate uh, link to educational information about that plant, uh, further information that can be found on our website. So here's an example of WeSatch, which um, sad to say, uh, we lost so many of those around the county uh, during the February winter storm. Uh, but being one of my favorites, this is a great example where you've got a close up, you have an overview, the QR code, and um, uh, it's just like our education and outreach. This is like a physical example of education that our chapter is doing for our uh, fellow county residents. So um, during the pandemic, we did a survey of all of the plant signs in the four locations. We've got them in two parks and two trails. So we have them in the parks of Williamson County, we have them in Berry Springs Park and Southwest Williamson County Regional Park. Berry Springs Park, so beautiful. 
when we surveyed uh, the plant signs there, we have about 36 signs and one had been hit by a lawnmower and we got that fixed. And uh, everything um, looks pretty good. And in general, I'd say that the plant signs, uh, we were pleasantly surprised. We have a plant kiosk in, at the western end of the park. Instead of plant signs, we have this kiosk and it works just as well. It's kind of like a plan B, but we like it. Uh, Susan Blackledge retired as the longtime park manager of Berry Springs Park and Preserve just uh, in May, I think, just a couple months ago. And uh, we have found out that Mark Pettigrew, who is, will be the new manager of Berry Springs Park and Preserve, he comes from the Williamson County Parks Department, and he's famous for those Mark in the Park videos. Uh, the second place we have signs is Southwest Williamson County Regional Park off of uh, County Road 175. Uh, there we have 12 signs and um, the big uh, disappointment was the that beautiful we such specimen uh, is now deceased due to the February winter storm. I guess like um, a lot of the we such trees um, in Texas, like they're just gone. That's, they just couldn't take it. It was a little too much for them. And uh, this was a beautiful specimen, like maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 feet tall, 15 or 20 feet wide. And so um, we just took out that sign completely. Uh, two places in the trails of Williamson County, we have interpreted plant signs. Brushy Creek Regional Trail east of Farmer and Brushy Creek Regional Trail west of Farmer. Here's to the east, remember it's got a dam over there. And uh, we have 20 plant signs uh, east of Farmer Lane. Um, everything looked pretty good. Russia Creek Regional Trail West uh, has that awesome railroad bridge with the big granite blocks that fell off uh, from the train that one time. That's cool. I think that's cool. Russia Creek Regional Trail West ha also has 20 plant signs. And uh, we found, um, you know, some damage from rodents. I, I don't know if squirrels are literally chewing on those. Uh, we found some damage from the winter storm where limbs or things had fallen on the signs, but really minor scratches throughout uh, all four locations, you know, pretty in pretty good shape considering. What is the future for our interpretive plant signs? We are working with an Eagle Scout who approached us uh, about doing some interpretive plant signs on the Lake Creek Trail, which um, I think we're gonna get uh, five or six signs installed. That's his, that's his Eagle Scout project. So that looks like that's gonna be a go. And um, the uh, Lake Creek Trail, uh, if you've ever been to a soccer game out in town and country, uh, it goes right through that park, which I didn't realize that, uh, but it's the town and country Optimist Club Fields is the official. Uh, location, but it is uh, west of Palmer Lane and kind of south of very southern edge of Williamson County. So what have we done for you lately? Uh, number one, we finished a plant list during the pandemic. Uh, finalization and presentation of the Gary Park plant list. Oh, and uh, but let me just touch on if you don't mind, uh, what is a plant list? plant list is a printed record, okay? It's an Excel spreadsheet, um, usually ends up being about five or 10 pages long. Um, I know the Berry Springs plant list has 407 individual species listed. So it can be 200, 300 species, 400 species, uh, but basically a plant list is a result of the plant surveys that we have done uh, over, you know, every month, for a year. So you, you get a scribe to write all this down. We go out and uh, so uh, we've got a members who type all that up and love all that. 
botanical name checking and um, what who uses a plant list. So Gary Park asked for this plant list so that they could put it on their website. Um, park staff uses it. Uh, park visitors use it, citizen scientists, uh, students and teachers. So it's really uh, a great educational tool for our uh, fellow residents here in Williamson County. All six of our plant lists that uh, have been turned and burned by the field trip committee are available on our website. Uh, Galt is in Bell County and uh, Hidden Springs is just a baby. We've just got one page, I think, <laughs> but they're there on the website. So uh, back to uh, the first thing, the first of the three things we did uh, that we have done for you lately is we uh, got that Gary Park plant list to staff. And it was, I think, a week before Earth Day 2021, which they call, it's four day event and they call it Family Nature Fest. So it was great to put a bow on that and get that to them. Uh, now, why was it exciting for me personally to, for us to give this a uh, plant list to Gary Park? Uh, so in my opinion, this is like a new and exciting relationship. Uh, this Gary Park is a city of Georgetown project and um, owned, owned and operated by the city of Georgetown and the four other plant lists in Williamson County five, going to be five other plant lists in, in Williamson County are uh, county parks at the request of the Parks Department uh, presented to county commissioners. Uh, this is our first city relationship. So I thought that was significant. Um, also, right before the pandemic, uh, park staff had approached me about doing a slide presentation in the big house about, um, you know, for beginners, maybe a community outreach thing that they could do for beginners on plants, the plants of Gary Park. Uh, I know we have a lot of other groups in Gary Park, so we could be doing the birds of Gary Park or, uh, you know, master naturalists could do the insects and invertebrates uh, or just, I know that there's a lot that could be done. This is on hold, but hopefully, um, as we open back up, maybe this will be something fun that we can do. Now this room holds 50 to 80 people. So uh, I know our Zoom meetings are getting larger than that. But, uh, and if the public was invited, you know, not sure how that would work, but back in the day, this was a neat idea and um, just another way to expand our relationship with the city of Georgetown. Number two, what have we done for you lately? we started a plant list at Hidden Springs Preserve. So uh, this is a newly acquired property, which I'm gonna refer to my notes because I think it's 900 acres and it's home to the Gordon, Golden Cheek Warbler. So let's see if I've got that information here. Um, so the first thing that we did together as a committee, um, we did a private scouting trip on May 31st of 2021, which is literally four weeks ago. And uh, it was first first time that we got together and uh, went and did a scouting trip to see what the logistics would be of conducting a plant survey out here uh, for the 12 months, uh, a plant survey that would be open to the public, open to members. Oh, I'm sorry, not open to the public. A plant survey that would be a field trip open to our members, you know, uh, master naturalist, whoever uh, wanted to attend with us. But this uh, piece of property is not open to the public. Um, 900 acres, Golden Cheek Warblers and the city of Florence. And from that, first scouting trip, um, we went ahead and took kind of a basic list of plants we assumed we would find, being a Williamson County Park Preserve, I mean, and uh, built on that and developed this uh, first pass of a Hidden Springs plant list and got that on the website. 
Hey, Vicky, this is Gary. I just want yes, to sir. give you a 15 minute warning. Oh, thank you so much. No problem. Um, we The third thing we did is we reopened a plant survey, um, expanding on the River Ranch uh, plant list due to land acquisition. So River Ranch is a 1,000 acre park and they they, I think, I believe they acquired 350 more acres. So we had done that plant list, I wanna say 10 years ago. And so we're excited to reopen that plant survey. So what is a plant survey quickly? A plant survey is the on-site field trip, uh, usually two or three hours long. And you do, we do 12 field trips, one for every month of the year. So while we conduct these field trips, uh, we have scribes who write down the plants and we're going to be generating the plant list from this plant survey. So the plant survey, uh, we're invited by a public entity who owns public property. So it's usually the parks department and uh, we'll go to this specific property location for 12 months. Uh, and that might take two or three years, but we want to go once for every month of the year so that we can see what's growing in each month. Um, and with, I think that uh, the reason that it's my favorite thing is it's a great learning experience because I learned through repetition. River Ranch County Park, um, the plant survey, we're going to be expanding that. I think I mentioned that they had recently acquired 350 acres. Uh, this park is not yet open to the public because they're constructing the interpretive center, the guardhouse, um, camping areas. It's gonna be really nice. And it's, I know the pandemic has slowed it down a little bit and the rain too, but I think that it's still going to open this year, hopefully. I should have asked Sue that question. When will we hold, okay, so for uh, River Ranch County Park, uh, when we get that uh, plant survey started up again, uh, just watch our blog posts and please come out and join us. When will we hold in-person field trips again? We did, so starting last weekend, in-person field trips are back, so come join us. The first one was native plant landscaping in an HOA field trip to Sun City. Uh, Aaron mentioned earlier, um, it was our first in-person everyone invited field trip of 2021. Uh, we had 15 attendees, which is fantastic. And they started at the Horticulture Club and then went to two residences to see uh, different ways to install native plants in your landscape, but still be, uh, approved by the HOA, which is actually harder than anything. Second field trip of 2021 is this Saturday. So not a lot of notice, but please come out and join us. We're gonna go to Hidden Springs Preserve and get started with that second month out of 12. So first month was May, second, second survey is July. Um, something that I didn't know because it was recently hosted by Williamson County was the Leave No Trace training. I think they had that Leave No Trace training in May. It is not required for this particular preserve. It's required for Twin Springs, but not Hidden Springs Preserve. So um, for more details, subscribe to our blog and we'll be sending out a notice. If you want directions, I don't believe an RSVP is required, but if please go to our website uh, and you'll see under the blog post is kind of like the address and the where to park and whether or not there are restrooms and whatnot. The third field trip that we have planned uh, right now, uh, we have some other things in the works for the other months of this year. We like to go out once a month. Um, but we're still working on September, October, November. Um, for 2022, let's save the date for a trip to uh, Native American Seed. 
I've been trying to go to this place for 10 years. And uh, he, uh, George Cates, actually was one of our visiting uh, speakers. You can see him on the June 2020 virtual uh, field trip, I mean, I'm sorry, virtual chapter meeting uh, on our YouTube channel. And if you recognize these seed packets, um, Native American Seed has had a booth uh, right next to ours uh, for many years at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center plant sale. Um, and um, I'm excited to go out there and tour that property. It's about two and a half or three hours away, but I figure we can stop in Fredericksburg and have some great German food on the way back. So two of my favorite things about field trips, carpools and food, always included. All right, what are some final thoughts on the field trip committee? I just wanted to end by saying um, I'm very optimistic about our committee, about our chapter, about our county. Um, in 2018, Williamson County did a comprehensive parks master plan and they've got a lot going on, a lot of good things going on. And I see uh, many ways that we can continue to participate uh, with what our county has going on. I see unlimited plant signs, unlimited plant lists, and unlimited plant surveys in our future. So please come and join us uh, by attending a field trip. Come and join us by attending a committee meeting. Uh, everyone is welcome there. You can go to the website under what we do, get involved, uh, find us at the field trips committee. And um, I guess I just noted here some ways uh, that I find that field trip committee is a great uh, benefit to our organization. Um, you can learn through repetition. Season members are always in attendance to help you identify or uh, to guide us. Um, if you're a photographer or you like to write, you're perfect for our committee. And uh, together we can explore our beautiful area and learn how best to preserve and promote our native landscape to our neighbors, our friends, uh, our fellow county residents. So I think that's it. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you soon on a field trip.